Hi, good morning, everyone. How's everyone doing today? Welcome to my Sunday live stream where we talk about photography and see what's going on, what's new. And also I try to answer questions if I can uh, along the way. And I think I saw a question uh, very early on, so I'll come back to that uh, in a minute. But I just got back from uh, a photo walk this morning with uh, David Crook's uh, Virginia, Virginia Bellway Photography Club. <laughs> anyway, he does a great job running that, and I, I love going out every weekend and, and seeing what's new. And we're supposed to go to uh, someplace tomorrow, uh, Cambridge, and take pictures of ducks and eagles. I don't know, something like that. <laughs> He just he just asked me, "You want to go?" I said, "Okay, I'll go." So we have to we have to go out early tomorrow morning. I might vlog a little bit this time, uh, but I'll be taking uh, my OM1 with the 300 f/4 and the teleconverter, and hopefully I'll get some good uh, wildlife, birds in flight, and all kinds of stuff. But uh, let me say hi to everybody. I see uh, David's here. Oh, hey, David. <laughs> we were just there. I was thinking we could have went to Huntley Meadows right after breakfast, but uh, I, I didn't have my my 300 millimeter with me. So uh, as you know, I've been, um, <clears throat> I brought the the Sony out this morning because I'm testing out uh, a new lens someone sent me. I can show it to you actually. <clears throat> this is a, this is a 25 millimeter um, F 0 0.95. So even though it's like a wide angle, it's like 12 millimeters on micro four thirds. Uh, you get super creamy bokeh with it because it's at uh, or a very creamy blurry background because it's 0 0.095. So um, <clears throat> I've been having fun with that. Uh, this came in the uh, day before yesterday. So I took a couple shots with it uh, yesterday of Ellie. So if you go to my Instagram, I can show you some. That's something I should do more on my streams is just have the pictures ready. Um. Someone asked me this morning uh, if I'm streaming today and what the topic is. And I'm like, God, I don't know. I just turn the computer on and and just jibber jabber, you know. <laughs> uh, but, you know, I, I love getting out there and connecting with everyone and my my viewers here on, on YouTube because this is one of the few platforms, you know, that you can actually reach such a large audience around the world and and talk directly to some degree, to some extent, with with your followers. And, uh, I, you know, a couple of things come to mind I, I want to talk about, too. But let me let me pull up a picture. Actually. The seven artisans, they've been doing a lot. Um, Okay, how do I share a screen again? There it is. So this is one of them that I took. Oh, come on. Uh, Uh, this one of Ellie, and this is at 0 0.095 at 25 millimeters. And I was probably uh, maybe a foot away or, a, you know, like a half a meter away from her to take this. So it's so wide angle. Um, and, uh, oops, let's see. Why is this screen... Okay, um, there's this one, <clears throat> and, oops, this one, there's another one, this one, anyway, so that's where I started, right? I started with these, uh, with these pictures of Ellie, and, uh, Oh, these buttons don't work. Why not? Let 
Let me let me try something here. Nope. Ah. Anyhow, so though that that's that. Uh you know what really sucks though is, you know, I've been getting a lot of requests to do reviews and stuff lately. Uh so that, you know, I'll take the ones that I think are kind of interesting. But uh I guess this lens has been out for a while now. Um and it comes in micro four thirds, uh, you know, because it's an APS-C lens, but I'm using it on a full frame camera. And if I crop it to five by four, you know, I can set the aspect ratio to five by four. Uh, there's only a little bit of vignetting on the sides. And with this camera, I still get, uh, gosh, like 50 megapixels out of it. Um, so anyway, I'll do a review on this in a week or two. We'll see. I want to take it out some more and take some more pictures. But uh, yeah, they, yeah, you know, all the freaking product review requests coming in the dead of winter and it's so freaking cold out. It's not fun. <laughs> you know, they should, they should, uh, you know, reach out to me like in the summer and winter or summer and spring and fall, not middle of winter. It's just ridiculous. Uh, but it's good because I just got this uh, Sony right a couple months ago, and I've only taken it out when I get a lens to review. <laughs> uh, but I did get a new lens for it. I got a um, twenty-eight to sixty kit lens for it because I was using my um, I was using this this lens that I had for my old old Sony that I have. Uh, and you know, it's sharp enough. I don't have a problem with that, but it's not a full frame lens. It's APS-C. So I'm only getting 23 or 24 megapixels out of it, which is still okay. Um, but I don't like, I don't like power zooms. I like a regular mechanical zoom. So, uh, I got a 28 to 60. I got it for like 200 bucks. So I'm pretty excited about that. <clears throat> I got such a good deal on a, on a kit lens. As you know me, I'm all about using kit lenses when I can. And that's my general philosophy right now is uh, when you choose your camera system, choose like your one halo lens. Like you want one particular focal length to be the very best or zoom. And then any other lenses you get in your collection, generally, you know, you can just get normal averages lenses. You don't have to buy the top tier glass and the other focal lengths uh, unless you know at some point you decide that those other focal lengths you really enjoy and want to have the very best quality but you know even these kit lenses that it'll get you about 90 percent there and uh if you need better than the kit lens you know make it make it the halo lens right the one lens uh, that that was a mistake I made with um, my Fujifilm system is I, I tried to buy all really good glass for it. And <clears throat> I've had the Fujifilm maybe three or four months now, you know, since October anyway. And uh, I, I've only taken it out once or twice since then. And I got all this really good glass for it. So, you know, the 56 1.4, it's not, it's not an expensive lens, but it's really good. The Sigma 56, and of course I got the 33 1.4, the 23 1.4, um, the 55 to 200. That's kind of a kit lens, but it does a good job. And then I have the original kit lens 18 to 55 that came with my other Fuji that I have because someone asked me on the, one of my Flickr pages if I was switching to Sony and I'm not switching. Uh, I just I just have a lot of different brand cameras and, and the only ones I really talk about on YouTube, <clears throat> like when I do my tutorials and stuff, is mainly because I know that camera best and I use that the most. That's my preferred system of choice and that's what I use is my uh my OM1 here uh or Pen F. Pen F I use the most actually. Um <clears throat> and that's that's why I do focus on that because I talk about the cameras I really like and enjoy. 
these other camera systems, they're kind of heavy and bulky, and there's a lot of overhead involved in post-processing because uh, the files are so big, you know, 40 megapixels on the Fuji, 60 on the on the Sony, and it's just unwieldy, you know. Uh, and that's just the post-processing side. In the field, man, this thing, this thing with this lens is so heavy, I had to buy a, a legitimate strap for it, you know. Uh, so I could carry this thing around. It was just, it's just ridiculous. You know, like on my, my OM-1 here, I'm using basically shoestring, you know? It's perfectly fine. And I love this because I can just, <clears throat> I can just wrap it up like this, put it in my bag, and it doesn't take up any space, the, the strap. Whereas this thing, oh my God, this thing, you know, the strap, once it's all kind of bundled up, it's almost the same size as the camera. You know, you, you know what I'm saying? It's like it takes up just as much room in, in the bag. So I can fit like one less lens in the bag because I have that big ass strap on there. Whereas this one, this, this strap doesn't take up any room at all in the bag, you know? Uh, and it's not, it's not a real strap. I, I literally made this out of paracord and some, and some key rings. And this is just wire uh, Velcro, you know, the little wire straps and ties. It's because the OM systems, the Micro Four Thirds cameras are so lightweight. You know, you don't really need big ass heavy duty seatbelt for a strap. You know, these, this is literally like a seatbelt in my car. <laughs> it is comfortable though. Oh, anyhow, let me let me get to the uh, the chat section here real quick and catch up here. Uh, so the first question was, Rob, I have the OM1 and I want the shutter and ISO on the AEL position one and shutter and aperture. On position two, but it does not work. I don't think you can assign the shutter button to any other button. The shutter button is fixed. Uh, you should be able to assign ISO to AL. And by position one and two, I assume you mean the lever switch, right? Um, but yeah, the shutter button can't be assigned. So what I'll have to do is. Um, <clears throat> I'll try and make a short video on that for you because it's going to be difficult for me to show you on the live stream. I don't have my overhead camera set up right now. Uh, let me just take a quick look though, Ron. Let me see. So lever, if you could leave another comment, if you mean lever position one and two, then I understand. If you mean custom settings one and two, that would be a different a whole different thing. So I need, you need to be a little bit more specific. Uh, but I'm going to assume you mean lever position one and two at this point. Let me see if anything comes to mind here. If I go into the button, lever menu, function lever settings, mode three. So you need function lever set to mode one. And then... Position one, you want ISO on the AEL. Yeah, I have my camera set up like so differently right now. Uh, I don't assign ISO to the button. But by... Yeah, I, I'm gonna have to, I'm gonna have to do a separate video for that. So I'll, I'll see if I can do that after the stream. <clears throat> um, Okay, let's see what else we got. Uh, Zoltan is here. Good to see you. And Wayne Cox, good day. David, Calvin from Lake Maine. And uh, yeah, cold photo walk this morning, right, Dave? Wasn't it actually, you know, it's in the 20s uh, Fahrenheit. So what's that? Like negative something Celsius, maybe negative five or thereabouts uh, Celsius. For those of you that, you know, don't know Fahrenheit. 
Um, after about an hour, I was pretty warm, actually. I wasn't as cold as I thought I'd be, so it felt pretty good. Um, <clears throat> and Bama and Terry, good to see you. Or ta Tahiri, I'm sorry. And System in the Chora. I keep forgetting you're in London. Marsha, good to see you from Florida. God, I'm so jealous. Florida is like the perfect birding spot, right? There's so many varieties of birds down there. You're so lucky. Um, up here, I have to kind of wait seasonal, right? When they come and when they leave. And then it's kind of a crapshoot when that happens. And Tony B, Jose, good to see you. Alan Worley, good to see you from England. Wow. And Robert's here. Robert 809. He's he's in the fight. And we didn't see you this morning, did uh, Robert? It was a good it was a good morning. I think I got a couple of keepers from this morning with even with that ridiculous lens. Um Jeff Painter, good to see you. And Thomas, good to see you. Three degrees Celsius and overcast, so it's pretty warm over there relative to where I am right now. Live and fishing photo. Oh my goodness, it's been a long time. How are you? And John Follows, good to see you. And let's see, Roger. Roger, it looks like it's a question. I have a 75 to 300 and 100 to 400 zooms. I find the 100 to 400 heavy to carry around on a hike. Can't even think in getting the 150, 400, or so. yeah. <clears throat> Yeah, the 75 to 300 is the way to go. And it, it'll get you like 90% there for most shots. Because I borrowed David Crooks' uh, 100 to 400, and I put it side by side with my 75 to 300. And clearly, the 100 to 400 is the sharper lens. But um, <clears throat> if you can get close enough to your subject, give or take, um, you can get really good results. And the other thing I noticed was, since I've been using the DxO Photo Lab, I get such good results. It the, the optical corrections and the noise reduction and the sharpening and and everything that it does, I get such good results. That's another reason I don't hesitate to use kit lenses and things because that software just makes those lenses really pop and look look like pro lenses. I mean, it's just amazing. Now, when you put a pro lens on there, it's shocking, right? It's just amazing how sharp those are, but um Anyhow, David has some info here about the weights and stuff. Let me just look at this real quick. 150 to 600 is 2 kilos. The 150 to 400, with a, that is 1.8 kilos. And the 100 to 400 is 1.2 kilos. And the 300 at 4, which I have, is 1.2 kilos. So it's only 100 grams, 150 grams more for the lens that I have. And um, <clears throat> of all those lenses, I still think the 300 f4 is the way to go. Um, but I am I am tempted by that 150 to 600, right? I mean, I'm I would be doubling my reach and only losing about a stop and a third. Uh, you know, because I think it's f6.3 on the long end, so that's only a third a stop and a third, right? Uh, that's doable, and um, you can even add teleconverters to that if you want to. But I think, uh, man, if you can't reach something at 1200, you know, 1200 millimeter equivalent, you're too far. <laughs> Need to learn to get closer if you can. Uh, let's see. And <clears throat> Aham has a question. Rob, what do you think of the impact of having attached a battery grip to the photography as a whole, despite the size and weight adds to the camera? Uh, okay, so the battery grip, basically the benefit is, you know, having an extra battery so you get longer run time. And then being able to easily handle uh, doing portrait mode where... You know, you can hold the camera like this, 
instead of like this. And I was thinking about getting a grip for my OM1, but they're 300 bucks. I'm like waiting to find a deal. Even used, they're like 250. They're not cheap. And there's no third party ones for like 80 bucks. Like for my, my Sony, I can get one for like 60, 70 bucks, third party. But anyway, uh, <clears throat> the idea is, is it makes it very easy to do portrait mode. And I think if you do portrait photography or you do events where you do have to turn your camera a lot to capture images, for me, in, in my mind, that's the best reason to have the grip uh, is if you're going to be doing a lot of portrait side type things, right? Portrait angled things. Or you needed that extend, extended battery life. In that case, the size and weight that you add to the camera is, is worth every, every gram or every ounce, okay? Uh, and that's why I'm seriously considering it. If, if I did events on a more regular basis, I only do two, three events a year, so I just deal with it. But if I was doing events, say, every month, uh, I would definitely have a grip right now just for that because it, it, I, find, I find that some events I'm shooting this way most of the time. And at other events, I'm shooting this way most of the time. And then all the, you know, but generally it's some combination thereof. And, uh, <clears throat> but um, that, that's why I would get it. Now, if you're thinking about in relationship to handling longer, heavier lenses, um, I don't think you should get it for that. I don't think that uh, adding a grip is beneficial because how often in wildlife sports action where you're using a super tele photo are you shooting this way? I don't think very often. Most of the time you're shooting this way and you're whole, you know, you're supporting the ca the camera via the lens and then just firing off shots with this hand. So for that I wouldn't do it for sports action wildlife type photography. <clears throat> Unless, of course, you need that extended battery life. But just carrying an extra battery is far easier than carrying an extra grip the whole time, right? So th that, that's my thoughts on that. I, I think it's worth it for events and things. But for sports action wildlife, not so much. And, of course, for general street photography and things, I don't think there's any point to have it. Yeah, shoestring on a budget. That's right. I literally took you know, about a, a dozen cr pa tiny creamer packets today from IHOP uh, that, you know, that they leave on the, they, you know, they leave on the table for everybody their coffee because I, you know, I'm just trying to avoid grocery shopping because I, I can get by with the little bit of food I got left. I'm all out of like veggies though. That's a little bit of a pain. I'm like on a keto diet right now for the last few days. But uh <clears throat> Uh, I'm all out of creamer, so this will this will hold me another couple of days, uh, and then I can, um, and then I'll go grocery shopping. I need to get some more uh, fiber. I've been having a hard time, if you know what I mean. Um, so I've been eating oatmeal twice a day, but I'm almost out of oatmeal now. Ugh. And David says, I swapped to Olympus because of size weight advantage and the UK equipment is expensive. So by trawling the used market occasionally, yeah, definitely buy used if you can. And good afternoon, Wayne and Bob and Ben. Oh, Ben. Wow, you're like local to me. I have very good friends in uh, Columbia. Uh, Walter, Walter Rowe and Debbie Rowe, his wife. I don't know if you know them. <laughs> I know you're in Columbia. I seriously doubt you know them, but he's he's a he's an accomplished photographer uh, as well. He does mostly portrait and shoots so the Nikon Z9 and you know the top tier glass for that. Ooh, Alan, yeah, that 12 to 40 Pro that is an awesome lens. As you can see, that's what I have on my uh, OM1 right now. This is this is the bread and butter of the Olympus system, right? The OM-1 and the 12 to 40 Pro. There's very little you can't do with this combination, uh, and not and and get fabulous results. Uh, this this is this is the best, I tell you. Um, 
and this is the perfect event photography lens as well. So you get this 12 to 40 and you put a grip on here, you're all set. And you know, I know I know Robin Wong has challenges with the kind of events that he does, but I've done a few events that weren't like concerts. They were like in somebody's house. And the face and eye detect is perfect. You know, I mean it's not perfect, but it's really good. I didn't have you know, I didn't have any shots that I could not deliver to the client because they were out of focus. Because I would take several shots. And out of those several, all of them would normally be sharp. But if there was one or two not in focus, it's okay. I took a few others that I can deliver. And um, uh, whereas in Robin's case, you know, he was constantly having problems. And I, I don't think it's his camera specifically. I think it's, it, is, it is definitely when you get into low light, low contrast situations, uh, that he is constantly in on some of his jobs. I, I I can understand why he's having a problem because I did I did find it. I mean I don't want to rehash that whole thing again, but hopefully the new OM1, the Mark II, has resolved that issue. Uh, <clears throat> well, you know I guess it remains to be seen. I'll never know. I mean I'm so tempted to get that camera because I have such bad gas, but I can't. I can't justify getting it because the OM1 Mark I is so good. It's, I mean, it does everything I want beyond my wildest expectations. And to, to, to try to see, use a camera that does even better, I just, I just can't picture it. You know, like, like this A7R5, right? It's supposed to have, you know, it's supposed to be the bomb, right? When it comes to autofocus and all that. But, and, you know, my use case is very unique, right? Everybody's going to be very unique. But I can't, I can't, I'm not finding that it's really focusing any better than my OM-1, you know, for just shooting, you know, eye detect or um, general photography. Now, it is true, when I turn around and have my back to the camera, uh, the OM-1 could lose focus, no question. I guess the OM-1 Mark II has fixed that. Whereas this one, it'll at least stay on the back of my head. But who takes the picture of somebody's, the back of somebody's head? It just doesn't make any, any sense to me that, that, you know, you see these reviews of this camera and people are bragging about, look at this, when I turn my head around, it stays focused on the back of my head. And I'm like, why would you take the picture of the back of somebody's head? Maybe in street photography? But even then, those are like the most boring shots. Like if you're taking the picture of back of somebody's head. Uh, I don't know. What do you guys think? But yeah, anyway, that... I know the animal detect for Ellie. When I'm trying to take pictures of Ellie, uh, the... The old one is definitely better than the Fuji. I have an X-H2, right? Fuji, is it here? I don't know where it is. I put it, put it, I don't know. I can't keep track of cameras I don't use very often, but uh, definitely better than that. And the animal detect on the Sony, I'd say, is just as good. Uh, I haven't used it that much to take pictures of Ellie. I've been using the manual focus mostly, but uh, the few times I did have autofocus on Ellie, I was using my 55 millimeter Zeiss lens and the autofocus is really good. The animal detect is as good as the OM-1, but I wouldn't say it was better. It's just good, you know? It's just as good. So anyway, uh, <clears throat> but yeah, 12 to 40 Pro, man, you will be so happy. And just so you know, that this lens, I have the version one. This lens, I don't know, I, I doubt it'll show. You see all those spots inside? Look at that. Look at look at look at that. Look at all those spots in the lens. What happened is because I don't I don't know how many people here are new and how long you've been on my channel, but early on when I got this lens. I left it outside like this with no cap on the top in the winter time. And we had a snow ice storm overnight. 
So the lens filled up with ice all the way up to the top because all the rain went in this way. And uh, so I took it, you know, like two days later, I found it. I was like, oh, my God, I can't believe this has been outside for two days, upside down like this on, the, on a picnic table. So I brought it in the house. And as it thawed out, all this water was inside, so I kind of poured it out like this. And then I set the lens uh, over my space heater. I have uh, radiators here in my house, so it's, it's not hot. It's just a, kind of a warm, you know, warm uh, radiance. Um, and I let it set for a month to dry out because winter air is very dry. So this dried out after about a month. I put this back on my camera works great and yeah the images aren't as sharp as they were before right but it's still 99 percent there like this dxo software just cleans up all that haze and and mush that i get because of all these spots on the on the element um i use this for jobs right no problem uh yeah it's it's an awesome lens And let's say it's here. Good to see you. And let's see. Uh, your recent, oh, your recent black and white self portrait looked like you were from radio, classic old radio shows. Yeah. Yeah, I, I've been having a lot of fun with that. I'm going to do some more. Um, I'm still working on trying to find a style, though, right? I'm Right now, I'm just kind of imitating a lot of the different uh, photography that I see from the masters, right? Like Yusuf. Karsh, I think is his name, uh, Maplethorpe, you know, I can't remember their names, but I keep, I keep a bucket list of, of images that I want to try to recreate. And then once I start to get a feel for the ones that speak to me, you know, I can start adapting certain aspects of all these different photographs and, and coming up with maybe something that's more unique. Uh, <clears throat> like, I really like the very strong fr Fresnel type lighting, like from Fresnel lenses. Very harsh lighting in black and white. But at the same time, I kind of like the lower contrast lately. Uh, instead of getting deep, rich blacks and very high highlights, I kind of like a more muted black and white, a little bit lower contrast lately. <clears throat> so, combining this Fresnel, very harsh light, with low contrast is giving me an interesting look. I'm sure it's not new. I'm sure it's been done a thousand times before, but uh, it's something that I just recently started getting a feel for. And also, I want to learn more about color, doing portraits in color and coordinating the colors with the background and what I'm wearing, my skin tones. Uh, <clears throat> and then if I'm doing portraits for other people, coordinating those colors, right? And, you know, getting a visual separation by color and tone in addition to if there's any separation via, you know, depth of field or lighting, right? Having a darker or lighter background, et cetera. So there's a lot of different <clears throat> techniques, um, obviously in photography to create separation, to create drama, to create emotion. Uh, to tell your story, you know, and it's through light, shadow, color, right? Composition to some extent, um, elements in the frame, symbolism. There's so many things. And that's what I love about photography is you can just, this is just like a lifetime of learning of stuff. And uh, uh, portraiture is not, has never been my strength. So I've been trying to get good at it. And time to time, I'll crank a video out about how I did a particular shot. Uh, but I'm not doing anything that isn't already on YouTube, thousand other places, right? But I try to add a little unique spin to it in the sense of, you know, I'm using Olympus gear, I'm using a kit lens. Sometimes I'm using, you know, just very basic lighting. Like my last video on flower photography, I just used the LED off my cell phone, right? For light painting and a 10 second timer, or not timer, but 10 second bulb mode. Anyway, uh, 
10 second shutter on that bolt, 10 second shutter. And looking at, yeah, get DXO, man. Uh, oh. When, whenever you, yeah. <clears throat> I'm go I'm having a meeting next week with DXO about something. So uh hold off a little bit. After after I have that meeting, I'll see what's new. But I'm having a meeting with them next week. And Ron, good to see you. Um So you say you regularly watch, but usually after the live show do the oh okay. Sorry about that. I know. But I appreciate I appreciate it. But it is good to see you here live. Um, you know, leave a comment for me on, on the live stream after if you're watching it after the fact. Uh, I do read all the comments. Um, oh wait, let me go up here. Still love my M1X. Hi, Rob. Ever used the 40 to 150 with the 2X teleconverter? Wondered about the pick one. No, I have not. I don't have a 40 to 150 F2.8, which is the one that you can use teleconverters with. The other two 40 to 150s, the kit lens and the, uh, the F4 Pro, can't use teleconverters. So for those that don't know, uh, the 40 to 150 F2.8 Pro can use teleconverters. But you're always going to take a hit, especially at 2X. At 1.4x, it's very hard to tell. There is a slight dip in quality. But just a little bit, of, add a little bit of sharpening and post, especially with DxO. I couldn't tell any difference in my images uh, at 1.4x. But with 2x, uh, I did test out the 2x a little bit. And I didn't find it really any better than just cropping in after the fact because the the number of pixels you lose by cropping in is offset by the loss in quality of the 2x teleconverter. Of course, the teleconverter I was using was David Crooks, and he's got fingerprints and smudges all over his all the time. I tried to clean it before I put it on my camera, but um, you know, to really clean a lens, you need to have you need to do it at home with cotton swabs and a little bit of rubbing alcohol and and really clean the lens and then you get a very sharp so i have to give that caveat when i was testing the 2x teleconverter with his 100 to 400 i was not impressed and i felt like that the uh it was better to just use the 1.4 and just crop in a little bit plus i'm not a big fan of losing two stops of light that uh that hurts too because if you're shooting at higher iso you know, by two stops, that in of itself, the, the loss in detail of shooting two stops higher ISO offsets any gains you get in magnification anyway, uh, in my opinion. And then uh, Tony says, when I had my Sony A9 in 200 to 600, I needed a grip to help balance the camera. Otherwise, it was front heavy. Use a third-party grip, Mikey, but as you say, no third-party grips for OM-1. Yeah. Um... I, I guess I should caveat that a lot of people do find what Tony's saying, the balance, right, from front to back is, is better. <clears throat> so even though it is heavier, when things are balanced, it doesn't feel as heavy. It feels it's more comfortable and easier to manage over time, you know, when you're in the field, when the, when the setup is more balanced. Uh, for me, I shoot the 300 F4 Pro, so it... it it's not, it's not that bad, uh, and I'm always holding the camera by the front, you know, by the foot, you know, of the lens or the lens barrel, and then so it's balanced in my left hand. But the 200 to 600 is a much longer lens, right? So it's going to be very front heavy, and you can't hold the lens, you know, you can't you can't like extend your arm way out and hold like this. To ba you know, it's kind of unbalanced, so grip would make sense in that, that situation. But, 
Unfortunately, you know, like I said, the, the grips for the OM1 are so expensive. I wish there was a third party option. I think about adding the BG to my camera. Okay, battery grip to my camera made me shoot more in the vertical orientation than I used to. Yeah, definitely. Uh, what I do <clears throat> is I just shoot in uh, one by one aspect ratio a lot of times. <laughs> that way I don't have to think about twisting one way or the other. I can compose every. You lose pixels, but you know, the, for the things that I shoot and what I, you know, I shoot just for Instagram and Flickr, it doesn't matter that I have the highest resolution. And when I deliver images to my client, if I shoot one by one, uh, again, I'm delivering two megapixel images. So, you know, I don't need to have all 20 megapixels to, to deliver to begin with. So I shoot one by one quite a bit. Um, you know, I shoot raw. So when it comes in the post-processing, I have the full frame. But when I'm composing in the field, a lot of times I'll have it in one by one. Uh, in the camera, so I don't have to worry about flipping one way or the other. Um, but, you know, to each his own. That's just the way I do it. And then, Rob, the, like a DG Nocturne 42, what would you rate this as top tier portrait lines over the 75? I think it's 75 1.8 from Olympus. But or maybe there's a typo and you meant 45 1.2, right? Because they have the 45 f1.2. If you're using an Olympus camera, get the Olympus version. Because um, that'll give you access to the other features like uh, the in-camera focus stacking. I think that's really the main one. Uh, maybe the, the high-speed shutters. I mean, there's a couple of little things, but, I, you know, I haven't shot with either of these lenses. Right, but I can tell you that rule of thumb is the Olympus lenses will always perform better uh, on the Olympus cameras, uh, even when it comes to autofocus. <clears throat> like I've heard, I've heard uh, people talk about the 100 to 400 Panasonic on the OM1 doesn't work as well as it does on a Panasonic camera. But the 40, you know, the 100 to 400 Olympus works great on the Olympus because it has the dual sync IBIS and all that. But in this particular range, uh, I would I would still get they're both excellent. I've seen side by side comparisons. Uh, I think Jimmy Chang did one. Go to go to Red 35. Uh, Jimmy Chang I think did a direct comparison between the 45 1.2 and the and the Leica one. 1.2. If it wasn't him, it was. There's definitely one out there where they did side by side, and there was really no difference uh, at all in terms of of image quality. And Eric, you're in Fairfax. I didn't know that. You should you should come out to the Virginia Beltway Meetup Club with us. Uh, I I go out every, almost every weekend. Uh, it's, it's in the Meetup.com. Just look for Virginia Beltway Photography Club, and you'll find us. Or maybe, maybe, David, if you're still here, you can put a link to it. Well, I guess I'm here. I can put a link to it. There, there's a link to come out. Unless you have been out and I just don't recognize you. But you don't look familiar based on that little thumbnail. Uh, okay. And let's see. The OM1 battery gives, gives me better feeling in haptic for wildlife photography because this, I like the haptic of, okay, interesting. I mean, I don't have the grip, so what can I really say about it other than my perception, right? Um, I just know I wish I had the grip for event photography. For wildlife and my 300 F4, I just don't see a need. Uh, but if you have a bigger lens, maybe the 100 to 400, the 150 to 400, the 150 to 600, it probably make more sense for balance.
Then John Thomas says, I need an external monitor for load to the ground photography. Any thoughts on a good one? Uh, yeah, the, the, I did a review on the Andyson M6, I think. But uh, the Andyson brand is really good. Let me just type it here, Andyson. Uh, let, me, let me find that video. And then I'm going to add a couple of uh, comments as well. Okay, so that's the video on the Andyson. <clears throat> uh, this is a good little monitor. Um, and when you say low to the ground, that means you're going to be pretty close to the monitor, so it should be bright enough. But this is the caveat. These, these $100, $150 monitors are really good indoors and mediocre outdoors if it's bright out. If it's kind of like dusk or dawn, and of course at night, no problem. But midday sun, or if it's cloudy out, you, you'll be okay. But if it's midday sun, it's very, very hard to see the monitor in bright daylight um <clears throat> outdoors even with the hood on okay because it comes with a little bitty hood so in that case you want to look for a monitor that can get up to 1000 nits nits something bright like that and of course they're going to use a lot more battery power so you know you're going to have you're going to have to carry more batteries so it's going to be a little heavier to carry around than say these little hundred dollar monitors but um you might spend two hundred dollars on a on a thousand nit uh, monitor, but that thing is bright. You can see that from like you know ten feet away, three meters, no problem. And <clears throat> I would recommend getting at least a, a six inch monitor in any any uh, price point. You know, get six or seven inches, uh, so it's big enough for you to really be able to focus things. Because a lot of times on um, when you're low to the ground, you can't rely on autofocus, uh, <clears throat> you know, because you want to you want more precision usually when you're low to the ground, and sometimes autofocus you just can't get that point exactly where you want it to focus to, so you you manually focus. Uh, and these monitors will also have um, focus peaking features built into them, which is important if you don't shoot Olympus. If you shoot Olympus, you can use the focus peaking in the camera. That focus peaking comes through onto the monitor. Whereas this Sony camera, when I have focus peaking turned on and the monitor plugged in, two problems. The monitor turns off completely. And I have the HDMI port plugged in. And then the second one is the, H, the, the focus peaking doesn't translate either, doesn't go through either. So I was trying to do some manual self-portraits, and I had the camera hooked up to a big monitor, but I couldn't use the focus peaking. So I, you know, I had to pre-focus and do that whole, you know, rocking back and forth and zooming in, all that, you know, that. Bit. So, but our Olympus cameras, when you plug in the HDMI port, you know, everything goes through. Now you do lose access to like uh, in-camera focus stacking. And I think live comp still works when you hook up an external monitor, but there's a couple of things that get disabled when you hook up an external monitor. So uh, I can tell you what they are if I hook a monitor up, I just need a cable. Because <clears throat> that's the other thing. Uh, if you want to do focus stacking and use an external monitor, it's not going to work. Me... I need to, I need to plug this in.
<clears throat> All right. So if I go into the menu and it's upside down. Really? Resize, transform. Why is there no screen now? How about me? Oh, here we go. All right. Uh, I think you lose access to... Seriously. Menu. Come on, menu. And... It's in the computate. Okay, so high res shot looks like it still works, but you lose live ND, focus stacking, HDR, multiple exposure, uh, digital tally, keystoning you lose, fisheye composition you lose. Yeah, live comp still works. And then you lose all of these bracketing features. So, uh, So when you're when you're when you have an external monitor hooked up, you know, just be aware you're going to lose a lot of the features, which is not the case on the Sony. I believe all of the features still work. You just you lose some of the display uh, features. But anyway, um, so if you're going to use it in outdoors and daylight, you want to get a thousand nits. Uh, if you're going to be using it mostly dust to dawn or on cloudy days or in, in sh under shade, like in a forest, then, you know, the $100 monitors, but get one that's about six inches. And, and the Andyson that I reviewed is really good. Okay. Uh, that's that. And yeah, Cisna, sure, I'm with you, right? I get everything I want from the OM1. Now, I will say that the extended buffer would have saved me a couple of times because uh, I was tracking this Kingfisher, man, and I got, and it started buffering right when he got right near the water. So I got this shot of him right near the water and then coming out of the water right? Uh, or like when he's already splashed into the water. What I would have liked to got is him, his nose, just going right into the water, right? Like just, just, just penetrating the surface of the water and getting that little splash around the beak. But the camera's buffering right at that split second. And I, I didn't get the shot. Uh, but, you know, I got a bunch of other shots I really liked from that day, but that would have been that would have been my like signature shot from for a long time. I'd be like, "Yeah, look at this shot that I got. This is going on the cover of uh, OM magazine or whatever, you know, whatever's out there. <laughs> cover of National Geographic. That would have been the shot, but I didn't get it." Faceless portraits is a thing. I don't get it. And then Thomas says, I forget which YouTuber recently asked where the dust goes after it's shaken off the sensor by the supersonic wave filter. Seems as if wherever it goes would need to be cleaned as well. Yeah, obviously, right? I mean, if if you're if you're using the ant, you know, most of the time that anti-shake, right, comes on, not anti-shake, anti-dust is when the lens is on the camera. Where's the dust gonna go? You know? It has to go to other parts of the camera. And it's probably going right to the grease that lubricates the shutter. <laughs> um, <clears throat> which might be partially why shutter's shutter life is reduced. Uh, but 
I would I would imagine. So I do blow out my the inside of my camera time to time. I never talk about it because I don't know if that's recommended or not. But but you know, I just use this little air blower I got and just blow it out. I don't touch the sensor with these bristles, but I blow out the inside with just some air. But like I so said, I don't know if that's recommended or not. But I, I do that every few months, not very often. Shooting bursts during dance performance off, often get headbacks. Hmm, that's true. That's actually a really good example of when having human detect, like the OM1 Mark II has, would come in very handy. Because I have shot performances and uh, I wasn't that close, so my depth of field was deep enough that it didn't matter. But I could see where if you're shooting, where you're filling the frame with a particular dancer, an individual dancer, and they're spinning around and moving, there's a lot of times you want the back of their head because it's more about their form and shape than it is their face, right? And human detect would make a lot of sense in that case. And that's where the OM1 Mark I would probably fail more often than not. That's a great example. Yeah, Marco. Oh, you know, I think, Marco, uh, you're selling your 100 to 400, right? So, uh, you're welcome to um, advertise it here in the stream if you want. You know, leave a comment after the stream. Because uh, I don't think you can leave comments uh, during the stream. But you can leave a comment there of how to contact you or whatever if you want. Okay. Um, some of the best dance. Yeah, I didn't even think of that. But thank you. Thank you for bringing that up. You're right. Now I can sound like I know what I'm talking about next time somebody asks me, right? <laughs> Expensive coffee mug. Not really. It was it was a gift. This was uh I guess this is from Star Trek. I forget which movie, but this is a replica replica of a prop that they used in the movie. This this company made the the coffee mugs for that particular movie, so they 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 duplicated this. It's got cracks in it now. You probably can't see it in the stream. There's a crack. There's cracks in here because I dropped it. <laughs> Thank goodness it didn't break, but they're easy enough to buy again. They're not that expensive. Especially with a crack in it, this is not worth very much anymore. Oh, hey, Gordon. <laughs> no, Ellie's, Ellie's not here. She's out. She's out in the uh, living room. I have a little heated blanket for her. So she loves to lay on that thing. <laughs> and then there's a general question here. Anyone ever bought and tried the Panasonic 50 to 200 lens also with the 1.4? I have not. That, I think a similar lens was on the roadmap for OM systems, but it's not anymore. Which is a shame. I think that would be a great... Uh, Focal, focal range. If it's like an F2.8, 50 to 200, I bet a lot of people would pick that up. Yeah, it's recovered. I still use it to this day. Yeah, the 12 to 40 F5, 4, F4 is definitely smaller and lighter. I mean, if you prioritize size and weight the 12 to 45 f4 pro is an awesome lens uh, i just I, I i have to prioritize low light when i use that lens because i use it at events indoors uh it's my primary use case for that and i need every stop of light that i can get congrats on getting featured oh yeah yeah they did they did use a i, I don't know which one i think they used one of my eagle pictures and I didn't know I was being featured, though. Other than they used a couple of my images. If you watch any of their tutorial videos, I, I don't know if they've edited any of my images in their tutorials and stuff, but yeah. That was cool. 
They asked me for more images, but I, you know, I, uh, I, I just, I kind of ghosted them on giving them more images. I really should have pursued that because they, they do, they do pay you, right? I got a good license fee for the, not, not good. They always kind of underpay, <laughs> but, uh, I didn't care, you know, cause a couple bucks is a couple bucks, right? Oh man. It's been so, anyway, so lean. Partially why I took all those creamers is because it's it's been real. I haven't had any real photo jobs in a while. I had a networking opportunity I should have went to. That was a mistake. Anyway, that's uh, nobody ever come to me for business advice, okay? Because I'm the worst, worst business person ever. <laughs> oh. I don't know what it is. Um, I must be. When I was younger, I was like, go, go, go all the time, right? But somehow when I turned 50, I just kind of gave up on trying to make so much money. It was actually in my mid-40s when I kind of really started to slow down on going for every dollar. Uh, and now that I'm in my 50s, approaching 60, it's like, it's not worth it. You know, I'd rather have time with my friends and family and doing what I enjoy than busting my butt every day trying to make a dollar. Let's see. The OM system 12 to 200 is a great lens, especially when combined with the Pen F. Very lightweight. I don't think that lens is very well lightweight personally, but uh, that range is hard to beat, right? That's a no-compromise lens when it comes to focal length. <clears throat> and it's weather-sealed, so... It has, a, it has a lot of pluses. The big minus for me is I, I don't consider that a small lens. I guess relative to what it's capable of, it is, but... Oh, thanks. The, uh, that must have been the flower one that I did. Yeah, that... <clears throat> that came out pretty good. I was pretty surprised because <clears throat> I was taking pictures for myself the night before and I was like, man, these are coming out really good. I should make a tutorial. <laughs> um, and then Tony says, I've been running some tests between DxO and Pure Raw 3 and photo, and I have to say that Topaz's latest version seems to be slightly better at retaining de detail ahead of... I think that's because Pure Raw 3 doesn't have... Uh, I haven't tried it myself, to be honest. Topaz has reached out to me a few times to use their software and, and demo it and stuff. I should take them up. I might take up, take up Luminar, though. Luminar, they, they keep reaching, and they've reached out to me again, even though I've kind of declined them in the past. Um, I might have to try it again and see. But I had a hard time wrapping my brain around the workflow. But that's the thing, right? That's the great thing is all these software have like 30-day free trials. So you can download them, try them, and see. Maybe I should download a free trial. Of, I don't know if I can download Photo AI anymore. Because uh, I downloaded their Topaz Sharp. I don't know. I can try and see, but... Uh, I'm so happy with DxO at this point. It's kind of like the OM1, right? I'm like, how can it be any better? You know, it just does such an amazing job already. But maybe, maybe it is. Um, uh, maybe I'll have to reach out to Topaz and see, see if they'd be interested in, in giving me a copy to try. Um, and run some comparisons. And Penny like on my M1 Mark II is outstanding quality. Okay. So there's there's a person that has no problem with that lens, the Panasonic Leica. I mean, it's, it seems to me like it's an excellent lens. I, I can't imagine why anybody would be having, like Emily, Micropore Nerds Girl, had no problems. 
swapping lenses between OM and Panasonic and vice versa. But I've just I've just heard like in the forums, because I, I do frequent the forums, MU43.com and the uh e-group users uh, group in, in in the UK. And then I also I, I shouldn't do this, but I also dive into the 43 rumors threads where they people leave comments on the articles and read those. Wow, that's that's a harsh, harsh group, man. They are they are so jaded by YouTubers like me. Like, you know, they just, man, they just, they just hate YouTube, it seems like. Um, and I get it, right? It's like, and, and this is something, what's his name was talking about? Uh, Eric? My, my brain is foggy sometimes. Uh, damn, I just had, I had him live in a stream with me together. And I can't remember his name now. Let me let me look it up. Eric, yeah, Eric Jennings. <clears throat> so Eric Jennings, I'll I sh I'll post it in my community tab, a link to that video. But it's one he just posted, I think, yesterday or the day before, about. Um, he didn't want to be just like another copycat YouTuber, right? He wants to try to produce original, unique, authentic. Uh, what was the word he used? Um, you know, authentic. I think authentic was the word he used. But, uh, you know, because there's so many channels out there, you know, as soon as a lens comes out, everybody's got a review on that lens or a camera. Everybody's got reviews on that camera. And everything is about gear, gear, gear all the time. And I get that, you know. Uh, I do it because I, I want new gear. I've been getting gear for my Sony and Fuji from these manufacturers. And, um, you know, so I review them. Partially, if I didn't need those lenses, I may not do those kind of reviews, right? But since since I I can use those lenses, I I say yeah I'll take it I'll review it for you why not, um and then and then I get a free lens, but um like I did that fifty millimeter f one point eight, I was kind of on the fence about doing that one because I have a fifty already, but um some of the reviews I do them because you know they're hopefully you guys find them helpful, right? I try to do a more educational type review lately where I talk about, well, if you watch any of my, my lens review that I did on this 50 millimeter F1.8, that's going to be more the style of the review that I do. Honestly, the person that does the best reviews, and someone else mentioned this in the last stream, is uh, Chris, Chris, Christopher Frost, right? And what makes his reviews work so well for lenses is very consistent. I mean, you can go back to a couple of years and look at a lens review on his channel, and it's exactly the same methodology he uses today. Now, if you go back four or five years, I don't know how long he's been on YouTube, the methodology is the same, but it's a little bit dated. He's added more things, like he added... Uh, uh, looking for coma. Um, he got a new chart for focusing, things like that. But it's very, very consistent. If you want to know about the sort of the optical quality of the lens, right? How sharp it is at corner to corner at different apertures, at different focal lengths. You know, what about coma? What about flaring? So he looks at a lot of the optical qualities. He looks at also the autofocus. So it's it's very it's very good in terms of consistency. You can go to his channel and watch a video review and get a very consistent comparison from one lens to the next. Um, but it's not complete by any means, right? I mean, who who can do a complete lens review in in ten minutes? But. Uh, I would say start there if you're interested in, in, in a lens review. But anyway, back to Eric Jennings. Uh, 
there there is a certain lack of authenticity in a lot of channels they treat their youtube channel as a business first and then um and then content is all surrounded about around this business model right and you know like tony and chelsea you know I, they love photography but their youtube channel is a business channel and they their focus of their content and everything that they do is around that business model and that comes first uh so are they authentic yes i i don't think they're being dishonest they're just sharing you know it's their opinion their voice about gear or whatever photography topic they want to talk about and that's where that's this is where i disagree with eric a little bit in his video about authenticity is is really everyone has their own voice and their own opinion you know i'm just one person one opinion don't take my word for it right you always got to do your own due diligence uh when it comes to looking at cameras and products and technique or style you know whatever it is you look at on youtube don't rely on one person you know certainly there's people that you like and you want to start with and say okay i'm going to look at rob's first or i'm going to look at christopher's first uh you know i'm going to look at that first before i go anywhere else like if i want to look at computer stuff i go to you know hot hard hardware right i go to marco's channel that's where i start because i know exactly where he's coming from i know his background and he's authentic right <clears throat> uh but when i want to um so when you when you you always start somewhere and then you build from there so you never you never can just watch one 10 minute video and get a fair uh look at what you want to know like gordon lang if you want to look at a camera review gordon lang at camera labs is probably the best in my opinion so i definitely although i may not hit his review first because his are long right like 30 minutes but I would definitely, before I make a decision, watch any review that guy does on a camera. Because uh, it's very thorough. But it's not everything, right? You have to look at all the different things. Like, I really like how Chris uh, Chris Nichols, he, he kind of points out things. I <laughs> We're very different, right? But he points out things time to time that, you know, other people might not mention. Um, so again, you have to kind of like go through. And then the final thing you need to do, particularly when it comes to cameras, is download the user manual for the camera and look for very specific features that you're interested in and how they operate. Uh, for example, I was I have some Canon glass that I need to either get a camera for, because I don't have a Canon camera. But I have glass and I'm thinking I need to get a camera body to use with this glass or sell the glass and get glass that I would use on a body that I already have, which is probably the smart thing to do rather than buy another freaking camera, right? Um, but I downloaded the manual for the Canon R100, uh, which is their cheapest mirrorless camera right now. I can get I can get that camera with a lens for 300 bucks on eBay right now. <clears throat> and it has the Digigate processor, 24 megapixel sensor. And I'm like, okay, no no touch screen. I don't care about that. I don't care about the the flippy screen. You know, this is just going to be just a little dinky camera, right? For whatever that I'll probably never use and this is why I decided not to get it. Although I may still get it for 300 bucks. I mean, but anyway, uh, I downloaded the manual for it and I was like, damn, you know, the USB-C port is, can only be used to transfer images from the camera to the computer. You can't use it to charge the battery or to run the camera. If I didn't download the manual, I wouldn't know that. Okay. Uh, because I, I I was thinking if I can get a camera that I can power via USB C, because the only camera that does that on the OM system side is the OM1 and the EM1 Mark III. And the EM1 Mark III, when you plug in the USB C port, it disables the HDMI port. 
And they're way too expensive to be a webcam, right? Because what I want to do is I actually want to replace my EM10 Mark II that I use now for my streaming. Because I hooked up my OM1 and I hooked up my EM5 Mark III for the webcam. And the image quality is marked markedly better. I was I was surprised. I was like, man, that that image looks really good, you know. I mean, not that it's bad now. It's certainly good enough for a live stream. But uh it was so much better with the EM1, EM5 and OM1. So I was thinking, okay, so I can get I can get maybe a Canon R100 with a lens for 300 bucks use that as my webcam and then i can start using my em10 mark ii again for like regular photography because i love that camera but it's being it's wasted sitting here as a webcam uh so r100 is kind of a it's kind of a deal breaker if i wasn't thinking about using it as a webcam i would probably get it as just a little pocket because it's so tiny. It's like this, right? It's so tiny. Uh, but then I, I don't know why. I would never use it. Because I had a Canon M50 for a little while. And I never used that camera. And that's tiny, right? It's like EM5 Mark III size. I was like, I can just take my EM5 Mark III out. Why would I take out an R100? I don't know. I, I, I have issues with gas. You know, I may I may go out tomorrow. You may find me with a Canon next week. I got like this bug up my butt to, to get a Canon camera. I don't know why. I'm going to borrow Dave's. So Dave, don't forget your can. Dave has an old Canon 7D Mark II. And I have EF glass. So I was thinking. I'll just I'll just use his for a while. And get get it out of my system. <laughs> All right. Um, let's see where I'm at on the chat. Oh, the price of the 40 to 150 kit lens is now almost two. It used to be a hundred dollars. Yeah. I see them on sale though for like $140 time to time. Uh pretty regular. But you used to be able to get that thing for a hundred dollars all day long. You know, almost any every other month it would be on sale somewhere for a hundred dollars. Now it's pretty hard to find. I mean it's just inflation. Uh and, and the fact that, you know. They can't sell as many as they used to, right? So Bauman says, Today I went to Nearest Woods with my M1 Mark II and with a battery grip and the 45 1.2, and I tell you, it was an amazing combo. Battery grip is not only for portrait and wildlife. Interesting. I don't know, you know, maybe I got this whole battery grip thing wrong, but I can't, I can't imagine. Cause I, I have a, I have an, you know, this is my dilemma, right? Do I get an EM1X, which is an awesome freaking camera? I, I found one for 650 bucks. I'm like $650, man, that's nothing for a camera like that. But I got my heart set on like a Panasonic S1R. That is the one camera I regret selling. I've sold a lot of cameras that, you know, I could care less about, like my Canon M50, my Fuji X-T30, uh, some other ones. I'm like, I don't miss them at all, but that S1R, like I had an S5. Don't really miss that camera. I miss it a tiny bit, but S1R, oh man. I miss that camera. Anyway, oh great, good to see you joined in. 
The next meetup is in Prince William County. Let's see what I can do. Looks awesome. I imagine you use Ace Photo or Dominion Camera a lot. Um, yeah, they're great shops. I use actually District Camera mostly. Uh, Ace Camera, Ace is all the way out in Ashburn, and Dominion is in Arlington. Those two locations are a pain in the ass to drive to for me. Arlington's not that far. It's like it's like it's only it's only like 15 miles from my house, but it takes like 45 minutes for me to get there. Um, so I'd rather go to the district camera in Burke. It's a 30 minute drive. It's about 25 miles. It's 30 minutes. So it's like, like that, right? <laughs> but it takes longer to go a shorter distance because of all the lights, stop lights. Cause it's like in the heart of Arlington. Uh, and, and Ashburn, you know, that's out in the fricking boon. Cause I live in Prince George's County, right? Near Andrews Air Force Base. Uh, National Harbor, maybe you're more familiar with that. So it's easy for me to go to the Burke location. And then right near Burke is uh, uh, Burke Lake Park and some other really nice parks in Virginia that I can go to from there. Whereas if you're in the middle of Arlington, where are you going to go? You can do some street photos. Arlington's kind of a nice place to do street photography, but that's cool. I hope to see you out uh, next time. Um, make sure you identify yourself introduce yourself because i'm not i'm not going to remember in a week that we had this conversation at all to be honest <laughs> my memory is so bad yeah kingfisher is going to be a problem i did get that shot you may oh man i'm jealous <laughs> the shot where the beak just goes into the water breaks the water right Yeah, it's almost almost a justification, right? Almost. And Marco says, uh, says I'm late. Sorry for this. I asked. I said I say a post today for one of the OM ambassadors that he got his two OM 1.2s in the U.S. Texas already. Do you know if they started shipping? I haven't heard. I haven't heard. I think you're talking about uh, Lee Hoy, right? Um, <clears throat> I only say that because I saw his video and he, he, he has two. And just FYI, I have Lee Hoy and Emily Talpin coming next month, uh, live stream. That's my guest. So I'm really excited about that. I need to, I need to put the uh, thumbnail out there and, and start uh, promoting that. Or promoting is the wrong word. Just let people know they're coming. Like just an awareness campaign, I guess. Uh, but I, I haven't heard. Plus, you know, and plus he's an ambassador, so he might he might get a little more priority on the shipping, right? Now, now I'm like one in the OM one mark two. I got to think of what I can sell to do it. If I can, if I can, if I can swap for about five hundred bucks with trades and things, I might do it. But I don't think I can get within five hundred dollars of. If I trade my OM one, I mean I can sell it, I guess outright. But I'm always nervous about selling it, you know, and getting ripped off. You know what I mean? Whereas if I go to the camera store and trade it for like half what it's probably worth. I know I got that half. I'm so risk adverse, it's not even funny. But I, they'll probably give me like six or seven hundred bucks for it. You know what I mean? And then try and sell it for twelve hundred is what I'm guessing. And that would be painful. And then uh, what else could I trade? I got some Canon glass I can trade. That's maybe two hundred bucks there. Uh, so I'm still like a thousand dollars away from. The OM1 Mark II. I just, I don't know if I can do it. I mean, if I sold everything myself, I could do it. I don't know. I should ask. I maybe. I don't know. If anybody wants to buy my OM1 Mark II, but I don't know what the market is. I think the market right now used is like twelve or 1300 is my guess. Make me an offer. I'll have to think about it. I mean, it's not really for sale. 
But if I, like I said, if I can get within five hundred dollars of an OM one Mark II, I, it might be worth it. Now what's this? That's funny. There's a sticky pad that goes around the supersonic wave filter that catches the dust that falls off and does eventually get filled. Oh, really? I didn't know that. That's interesting. Ooh, I got some rumors, man. Man, do I have some rumors about OM systems. I forgot all about this. <laughs> I don't know if I, I, if I, it's a, it's, I, it's hearsay. I'm hearing it from third, like, they heard it from somebody that heard it from somebody that heard it from OM Systems. Because, you know, I get, I get people contact me all the time about stuff, right? They want to, they want to uh, jibber jabber about, you know, what's going on with OM Systems. Some people are really mad about the Mark II. Some people are like, you know, under, you know, are content. I guess is the best way to put it. They're not ecstatic or happy about it, but they're content and might upgrade to the OM1 Mark II. I'm sort of in that category. I'm like, oh, it's okay. It's just a, it's a nice little update, but it's not like a full-on upgrade to the OM1. It's just kind of an update. Uh, some some argue that you could just do it with firmware. I, I don't know about that, but... Uh, yeah, let me, let, me, let me get through the... Uh, a couple of more chats, and I'll share this rumor with you. Um, before I forget, because next week I'm not going to remember. And then do you know what the restriction is on why certain lenses work for focus stack and OM1 Mark II? It seems that strange. Yeah, I know. I don't know why. I don't know why, Paul. It's definitely, you know, the the camera is looking for a specific lens to do focus stacking. And uh, I don't know why they, it's disabled on, on most lenses. It only works with a few of the pro lenses. And I, I don't think there's a workaround. You can focus stack. I'm sorry. You can focus bracket, right? You can always bracket with any lens, and then you have to stack it in software. But that's not as good as doing it in camera, I found. Unless you're using that really good, I forget what the name of that software. There's a really good stacking software. It's like 30 bucks that people use and, and get good results. I don't get great results with Photoshop stacking. It's fine for what I do. I'm not taking it that seriously. But I, you do get holes of, or patches of area that are not in focus when you use Photoshop for focus stacking. Or is this other software, Helio, Helio something, I think it's called. Uh, but yeah, the short answer is, there. I don't know why, why certain lenses are. And Marcus says, the 50 to 200 Pro is still on the roadmap. Not the, oh, okay, good, good. I thought it was taken off, but that's good. Marco just said that it's still on there. So double check the roadmap. Let's let's look. Let's look. OM system lens roadmap. Google is amazing. Um Share screen. So, oh, there is something here, right here. This is as of September 20. Oh, well, I don't know. I don't know if this is new or not, but this is on their website. Ninety macro is here. Yeah, this 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 lens chart is old. 
I, I don't know. Why is that so old? Where's the new one? This is 2021. Why do they have these old maps on here? How about this one? This is 20. Okay, here's the new one. All right, got it. Uh, so what are they saying? What's this blue? This is uh, this is about 50 to 250. It's still there. Okay. Oh, okay. So let's get to the rumor. Um, let me let me move my rearrange my screens back so I can see what's going on. Uh, so what I heard was that sometime in June they had a new firmware ready for the OM1 Mark One that had some. A lot of uh, stuff that we're seeing in the OM1 Mark II. I don't know exactly what you know those were, but supposedly June of last year. Oh, uh, somebody's at my door. Uh, right when I get into this rumor, right? Hold on. Hey. Oh, hey, Alex. What's up? Oh, oh, yeah. Yeah, definitely. But I mean, no, like, it's okay to go in the gate now? Yeah, yeah. Ellie's in the house. We're good. Thank you. <clears throat> All right. That's a good girl. Yeah. Get him. All right, <laughs> the guy, uh, the guy is here to rake the leaves in my yard. My God, it needs it so bad. It's winter, right? It should have been done like months ago, but anyway, uh, what was I talking about? The rumors. <clears throat> so, um, This is, this is what I heard, that sometime in June, they stopped production of the OM1 Mark I. I didn't know that. It seems like everybody else knows but me. But they stopped production of the OM1 Mark I. They had a firmware ready update. They also have an OM5 Mark II coming out. Uh, and they had firmware updates ready for the OM1 Mark I. But all of that got put on hold because of some kind of legal issue with OM systems. I don't know what that legal issue is, but there was some kind of dispute that OM system could not uh, update the OM1 Mark I. And that's why we haven't seen a firmware update in over a year, right? I think it's been since January of last year since we have had an update, a firmware update. And uh, what else did I hear? I heard something else. I'm not going to remember. But yeah, I didn't know they stopped production on the OM1 Mark I, so everybody was freaking out, apparently, that that was, that, that OM system might be going out of business because they stopped production on the OM1 Mark I. I never heard that, but apparently that's, that's what happened. And the firmware updates have stopped. And they're only going to do firmware updates on the OM1 Mark II going forward. We're not going to see firmware updates for the OM1 Mark I anymore because it has the Olympus name on it or for some other reason, uh, some other legal reason. So it's not, it's not that OM Systems isn't working hard to uh, improve their cameras either by firmware or releasing new products. It's because there's, some, there's something happened between OM Systems and Olympus uh, on a legal front. That's all I know. 
Anyway, uh, I was, I don't know, does anybody, has anybody heard anything like that? I haven't, this is the first I've heard of it. I'm so out of the loop. And, and this is the other thing, right? Sometimes I'm, I'm, I'm happy that the OM-1 Mark II wasn't like leaps and bounds better than the OM-1 Mark I. Because I would have bought it like yesterday. It had been pre-ordered day one. But because it's kind of an incremental update, I have to really justify if the new features it adds are going to be worth whatever price difference I end up paying. And, uh, but, but because it was just sort of an, uh, you know, evolutionary update and not a revolutionary, right? I'm like, I can take a break. I can just take a break and focus on my photography. We just need to take a break sometimes and just remember why we're buying all this gear and use, use it for what we paid all our good money for is to take pictures and enjoy that process. You know, if we're, you know, and I'm not, I guarantee 99% of, of you guys are not professionals now. Maybe you were, right? Maybe you're still working professionals. Um, but for the most part, I think most of us are just photography enthusiasts. We love photography. And this constant gear, constant update of cameras and gear and lenses, it's like really distraction to why we're, why we're buying all this gear and camera, right? <laughs> we're buying it so we can take pictures. And so it's a little bit of relief in one sense where, you know, I can take a break and just focus on my photography and not worry about, you know, getting this new camera and learning how to use it and all of that and all the great new things. You know, I would have been happy if it was. Trust me, I would have bought it day one if it was revolutionary. But since it was more evolutionary, uh, it, it did give me a little break so I can focus on my photography. Okay, uh, I hear the OM One X is coming out. I just I just saw a quick comment here. Let me let me go back. Um, yeah, see, Tony knows you're almost seventy. That's awesome. I hope I make it to seventy. I I think I think I I might be. Uh, I think by age 70, I might be totally gone up here. Uh, you can't get your head around that one either, huh? I know, right? It's it's a little different. I'm gonna have to I'm gonna have to work with it again. Yeah, the comments are the most cynical. Yeah. They are pretty harsh, man. They are they are harsh. And they're harsh on each other too, right? They're just, I mean, when when they post like the rare time that one of my videos get posted, the comments are never kind, right? And even when good videos are posted from some of my peers, the comments are not that kind usually, right? Um, they're just very critical of YouTubers in general. And that's fine. I really think there is a place for people that should be that, that like to read, you know, posts and forums and articles online and look at look at things online and read about it. And then there's people that just want to watch a 10 minute video, right? And get a little entertained along the way. Uh, you know, they don't take everything so seriously, right? They just watch, like, I like camera conspiracies. He just did a video about why he thinks all these YouTubers hate him. I didn't know the word Tone is banned on Tony's channel. Hey, let's try that. Let's try that. Hold on. Uh, I've been meaning to try that. If you if you type a comment in with the word Tone, it doesn't it doesn't it doesn't show. Let's find a Tony Northrup video. Um, man, how do I share a screen again? Where is, I got too many windows open.
Yeah, this is it. So, okay, this is sharing, right? Uh, Tony Northrop. Oh, they're doing lives again. Check that out. All right, this video is two weeks. Hyundai Tucson. And I to Tone. Let's do that. It's showing. I don't know. It's not banned. What is what is Casey talking about? It's not banned. Uh well we'll see if it sticks. You guys check it later. Let me let me refresh this. Let me refresh the screen and see if it's still there. It's still there. I don't know. Okay, uh Yeah, that's right. Right. You and you and I both have very similar similar past. But you you stuck with computers at least. If I had stuck with it, who knows where I'd be now? Multimillionaire now, right? Back in the day, I used to uh compete with uh uh Dell. Um Dell was very new, but they were much bigger than me, but I was catching, you know. This was back in the day. Anyway, uh I don't want to bring that up. That that was a crazy time in my life. That's when I was really going for every dollar, right? And then Norm is asking, have I ever done a comparison of the 75 to 300, 300? Yes, I have. Um, <clears throat> the 300 F4 Pro is better. Long story short, is it, is it, you know, $2,500 better, yeah, you know, it's, it's one of those things, right? It's like, you know, my little Mazda gets me from zero to 60, you know, it gets me from point A to point B just fine, but a Ferrari gets me from point A to point B just the same, right? But it costs that much more. Is it worth it? I don't know. Uh, depends what, depends, you know, it's like how much faster will I get from point A to point B in a Ferrari versus my Mazda? Because there's a lot of traffic and laws and traffic lights, right? And road signs. So there's a lot of, there's a lot of overhead when it comes to real world use, right? Um, so... Somebody with a 75 to 300 that is a better photographer and has a higher skill set is always going to get better images than me with a 300 F4 Pro. So, um, I did do a stream, though, where I compared them directly, and <clears throat> it was hard to tell the difference at 300 millimeters for a lot of the images. But these, these were very cherry-picked kind of images, right? I was shooting basically st still life. The birds weren't really moving. They were pretty far away. So there's a lot of atmospheric distortion. Again, what I'm then this is what I mean by overhead. When you're shooting something at 300 millimeters and it's very far away, you have a lot of overhead between your lens and whatever the subject is, you know, including atmospheric distortion, like heat waves or fog or pollution, whatever it is, there's a lot in between. So just like my analysis between my Mazda and a Ferrari, we're both going point A to point B, there's a lot of overhead in between, right? Point A and point B. So uh, <clears throat> yeah, the 300 F4 is definitely better, particularly that you, you get, you know, almost two stops more light into the lens. 
but optically it's amazing. The image stabilization, that dual sync image stabilization really makes a big difference. And of course the weather ceiling. So there's a lot of things in the 300 F4 beyond just the optical quality that, you know, drives the price up, but I have done it. <clears throat> and no one, no one will ever say that the 75 to 300 is a bad lens, but when you put it next to a 300 F4, this it's, you know, there's really no comparison. The 300 F4 is just optically superior in every way. And thank you, Marsh. I appreciate that. Click the like button. It does, it does help. It helps me like justify what I'm doing here and, and hanging out with you guys. Uh, that and any donations and all of that is, is great. But, um, You know, after I watch a stream, I want to at least feel like I was helpful in some way or passed on something of interest. Even if we're just hanging out. What's this? Just pointing out the technical difference. Oh, it's not for me. Sorry. Uh... Who needs to stream in 4K? Quite pointless. Um, I guess it depends what you're streaming. If you're just doing headshots, like Robin Wong, I don't know why he goes through so much trouble to shoot in 4K um, or to stream in 4K. I'm streaming in 1080p on an EM10 Mark II, but it would look it would look almost 4K if I was using my OM1 or something. Oh, just got a 5D. Awesome. I know. This, see, once you go down that rabbit hole, like, I, I want to get a Canon camera. It's like, okay, so for 100 bucks, I can get me, like, a, a 5D, or I can get a 7D Mark II, or I can get, like, you know, I got a lot of choices between 100 and $300. But then it's like, if I go 300 to $500, I can start looking at, like, the 6D, right? A full-frame Canon. Or 5D Mark II. And if I go up to five or six, six hundred to eight hundred dollars, I can start looking at 5D Mark III, 5D Mark IV, over a thousand dollars. But then when you're at a thousand dollars, it's like, why get a 5D Mark IV when you can get a uh, Canon R8? And then you're like, oh, but you know, the Canon R8, if I go that far, why not just get the Canon R6 Mark II? And then it's like, oh, but you know, the R6 Mark II, it's not an R5. Man, I got to get the Canon R5. That's the end of it. And next thing you know, you know, $4,000 later. <laughs> and, that, and that's kind of how that conversation went with this freaking Sony A7R4 or 5. This is A7R5. <laughs> I was looking at like an A6100, right? For like 400 bucks on eBay to replace my Sony NEX. And I was like, well, you know, for 400 bucks, I can get a brand new like a uh, 6400 or whatever the whatever it is and then for about $800 I can get the A6600 man if I'm going to spend $800 might as well get the A7 II right because they're selling for $1000 with a lens then I'll have a full frame Sony man A7 II that's a little old you know for about $1300 or $1400 I, I can get the A you know it goes on and on, and then next thing you know, I'm walking out the store with a freaking A7R5. <laughs> it's just, it's just so stupid. Oh my god, gas is ridiculous. It's just ridiculous. That's why I got an XH2, and all this. Oh. I don't know. Like if I didn't have the XH2, wow. Well, and the A7R5, I think I don't think I would miss them too much. Like I missed the S1R for some reason. I don't know why I missed that camera. It's mainly because the lenses are so good for the L mount system. I, I really like to get back into that system for the lenses. And that particular camera, the the image output from that camera was just gorgeous. I mean, nothing wrong with my Olympus cameras, but Something about that at S1R, the images that I got from it, I was I was just kind of taken back by it. And when I got rid of it to buy, I ended up buying this A7R4 
or A7 or 5, I'm sorry. This, this camera, the images do not wow me like the S1R did. You know, the images from my Olympus Pen F and, you know, any of my Olympus cameras always wowed me. I'm like, wow, look at that from this little tiny camera, you know? Uh, and I put it, and if you go to my Flickr page, I got lots of comparisons side by side. XH2, A7R5, OM1, Pen F. It's, the differences are so minor, you know, so, so minor. You know, if you pixel peep, yeah, you can certainly see the difference. And you can crop the hell out of a 60 megapixel image. No worries. You know what I mean? And still get great resolution and quality. But there's really no substitute for the user experience and getting fantastic images from a small camera system with very little overhead, you know? It's the path of least resistance to great images, in my, my opinion, is micro four thirds. I, sh I should quote that, right? That's quotable. The path of least resistance to great images is OM systems, or micro four thirds, I should say. Um, that, that's, that's just, you know, that's, that's, I should make a t-shirt, you know? But, yeah, it's like, I just had an epiphany, but, yeah, yeah. micro four thirds is all day long, every day, is the very best camera system, in my opinion, you know? Uh, there's, there's nothing you can't do with it. I guarantee if you, if you eliminate it, let's say, let's say I did a Thanos, snapped my fingers and got rid of every camera system except for micro four thirds. That was the only thing that existed. No Hasselblads, no phase ones, no GFX, no Sony full frame crap or APS-C, no like nothing, just OM systems and Panasonic micro four thirds. Okay. I guarantee very little in the photography world would change. People, professionals will still be producing professional images that they can deliver to clients and still print billboard size images or print in magazines, whatever they do. I don't know what professionals do. They would still be able to do their work. Ad agencies, agencies, other agencies will be taking work from Micro Four Thirds cameras and not seeing any impact to their uh, to their profitability when we're talking about business. And then enthusiasts and amateurs like us, right? Uh, we would see no impact in our, the quality of the work that we do, right? As enthusiasts and amateurs. I mean, I, I don't see, I mean, I'm just, I'm just speculating, right? I'm not a high-end professional photographer, but when you look at the work of the masters of photography, both living and past, okay? Um, they used gear that was far less capable than anything we have available today and produced basically timeless images, you know, stuff that people would pay big money for even today. So I'm gonna stop my fingers, that's the end. Nothing exists except for micro four thirds, right? <laughs> Unfortunately, we live in an alternative universe where I don't have that power. You know, I'm not in the multiverse, so. But I guarantee there is a Rob Trek in some multiverse that snapped their fingers and got rid of everything except micro four thirds. <laughs> in some multiverse, that has happened. It's just not, just not the one you and I live in, unfortunately. Okay. Uh, Oh, cool. EM5 Mark I. Nice. Awesome camera. I have the EM5 Mark II. That is the camera to get, man. The Mark II series in, uh, in Olympus, they were the best cameras ever made. And Brian James. Hey, buddy. How you doing, man? I saw you went live the other day. I caught you at the very end. I didn't, I didn't know you went live. Somebody on my Instagram uh, chat, 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 sent a message to me saying, Brian James is live. I said, oh, crap, I got to go check it out. It was too late. 
but doing well, Brian. Good, good to see you. And I'm sorry to hear about your condition. I think you mentioned it. I won't repeat it, but you did mention, I think, on your stream. Um, I hope everything's going well for you there. Nothing dire, okay? He's not dying, but definitely need to take care of yourself. Uh, Let's see, some curiosity, OM1 and OM1 Mark II has the same product certification number, IMO27, that's new, each camera got own code in the past, and TG7 OM5, now I'm not familiar with that, Kloss. I mean, I, I don't know what, what a certification number does for a camera, right? Does it mean that it's, that it, it didn't need a new certification because it didn't break any thresholds, right, to require a different certification. I don't, I don't know what it means. I'm sorry. Um, but for those of you that do understand what he's talking about, uh, let me know. I, I don't know. Helicon Focus, yes, that's the one. Like I said, I think it's like 30 bucks, right? It's not expensive, and people say it's great. Rob, I sent a Flickr invoice. Most of my photography is in our region. I just do random stuff. Oh, okay. I'll check it out. And then Enrico says, Rob, I have a question. Is TG6 or TG7 good for street photography? Is the pho uh, During the day, it's fine. At night, it's a little rough. You know, because it's a tiny sensor camera. It does shoot raw, and the F2 lens helps. Uh... And I've used it for street. Um, if you search my channel for TG5, because the TG6 and 7 have the same sensor and processing. And the fact that I use DxO helps a lot. But you can look at my videos for the TG5. I have three or four of them. One of them is at nighttime. And you can look at those and, and get a feel for what I thought about. I haven't used the TG5 in a long time, but. That'll give you a feel for what I thought about it at the time, but short answer is, it's fine during the day. You know, it takes great pictures. At night, it's a little bit rough. Uh, no, there's no third party firmware updates that I'm aware of. Mostly because I think on the, Fi on the Olympus cameras, you can only do the update firmware through their software workspace or through the app. Uh, the very old Olympus cameras, you could put an SD card in and update the firmware that way, but I don't think that's possible at all with the new cameras. Uh, so they're protecting their intellectual property rights by controlling the method of delivery. Uh, I did see something on mu43.com forum where somebody does offer like their own firmware that removes like the 30 minute time limit on movies and some other things. But that's a little risky for me. You know, I, I, I don't think I could do it. It's, it'd be fascinating. Maybe I'll try it for my EM10 Mark II. But go to mu33.com. It's mu-43.com and search for firmware update. And you'll see the thread where somebody made their own. But I'm not aware of any legitimate third party. Yeah, sometimes it feels like photography hobbies about buying new gear and not photography. I know, right? All the time. And since I'm 73, wow, and having a great time doing mainly wildlife. That's awesome. I really hope I really hope I make it to 73, but I don't know. You know, I'm a little bit psychic too, right? Um, I have these premonitions. Somehow I don't feel like I'm going to make it to 70. I hope I do. I hope I live to 80s or 90s, but I'm not feeling it. Like, I just feel like my life force is like, it's like my time is coming. I absolutely agree on focusing on photography and having fun. I know, right? Let's all take a break and just enjoy why we bought all this gear. 
Um, <laughs> Chelsea will probably remove it. Let's see if it's still there. I'm going to check. I'm going to refresh. I mean, it's Sunday. They're probably not even checking. I don't even know if they respond to chats. I haven't watched their channel. It's still there 20 minutes later. Anyway, uh, <clears throat> Xmeta says, I'm adding the M5 Mark III to my PL6, so now I'm thinking about adding a portable 12 to 50 or 14 to 42, but is it even an upgrade? I missed something like the micro M43, like the 18 to 135 I have for my AP. Oh. Um. I don't, I don't know why you would add a 12 to 50 if you have a 14 to 42. I mean, I, it's a great lens, the 12 to 50, but it's a power zoom. I, I, yeah, I don't know. I wouldn't, I wouldn't do it personally. I don't think it's, it would be a significant upgrade. If you're going to spend 100, 200 bucks... Uh, you're better off buying a flash or some other accessory than that lens, in my opinion. If you want to, if you want to take your photography to another level, that lens is not going to take you to another level. Some accessory might, an external monitor, uh, particularly a flash or a flash trigger. If you already have a flash, if you can get a wireless trigger for it or something if you're gonna because i think that lens is 100 200 bucks in that range there's a lot of other things you can buy you can buy a really good tripod you know there's a lot of other things you can buy at that price point that'll improve your photography more than using that lens over say the 14 to 42 kit lens and think about a camera for my nephew's birthday and the TG7 sprang to mind, though I think it might get more entertainment from a Fuji Instax. Yeah. Yeah, I, seventh birthday, yeah, Fuji Instax would be more interesting. Because, you know, th there's overhead with the TG5, right? You have to take the card out, put it into the computer, upload it. That's a little tricky for a seven-year-old. I mean, I know they're smart and they can do everything, but uh, I think... Just printing it out right there and seeing it right instantly on a piece of film would be a lot more interesting. I probably, I probably, and it's cheaper too, right? I'd get, I'd get them an Instax, and they got, they got that digital Instax now, right? Where it has the SD card in it, so you can take pictures. I use, I actually, I have a Canon Ivy. Uh, the Canon Ivy, the prints are a lot cheaper, like. Like 25, 30 cents each instead of like a dollar or two dollars each for Instax. Um, the Canon Ivy, and it has an SD card. So if you did want to take the SD card out and put them on the computer and do all of that, he has that option with the Canon. And, uh, or he can just print them out directly. And it's like, it's like I paid a hundred bucks for the camera, and then you can buy like a 20 pack for 10 more dollars. I think I I think the Canon Ivy is a better deal than the Fujis. I have it around here. So I put it somewhere. Yeah. I don't know. Too much too much junk these days. Uh I used to have it hanging on my door handles, so anytime I'd leave the house, I would take it with me because it was just, it's just fun to take a quick snapshot and print it out and give it to somebody. I haven't done that in a while. Yeah. <laughs> You're in your car. That's, it's weird to me that you like do your videos from your car. I mean, it kind of makes sense because it's it's generally quiet and and self-contained. But um... <laughs> that's cool. I'm glad you're still here. It's good to see you. Um, gotta go. All right, we will. Uh, 
We'll see you again next week, I hope. God willing. You can now get an R5 for... See, it's not just the R5, right? You got to get the 70 to 200 F2.8, or you got to get the, the, the 50, you know, F1.4, you know, it's like, so yeah, you 3K for the camera, then another thousand for your first lens. <laughs> you give me gas though, my God. I want an R5. Now I want an R5, right? Cause I got, I got this EF glass and that's, that's what got this bug up my butt. Like this, these lenses are sitting here, not getting any use. And they're so big and heavy. Oh my God, you wouldn't believe it. This is this is the kit lens, okay? This is the 17 to 35 image stabilized. Look at the size of this 500 and some grams. This lens. 1785. So it's basically a kit lens, right? It's equivalent to the 14 to 42. And and look at the size of this thing compared to, you know, this this is the kit lens for the Sony, but this is similar to the kit lens on the uh Olympus, right? Look at the difference. I mean, I know this this ex extends, but so does this one. This one has to extend out, right? So, um, you know, so I got this lens. This is worth maybe a hundred bucks tops if I sell it outright. I think I think MPB offered me. 100 bucks for this lens. I can't remember. But it's it's a good lens by all accounts, but 500 grams for this lens alone, for a kit lens. I mean, come on. And then I got a 70 to 300 as well, which is about the same size, it's just taller, right? Um <clears throat> I I don't know. I'm going to borrow Canon's, uh, David's Canon 7D Mark II and play with these lenses tomorrow. I'm going to use that 70 to 300 uh, with the Canon 7D Mark II tomorrow. And I'll use this. Maybe I'll use this instead of bringing my OM-1. No, I'm definitely bringing the OM-1 and my 300 F4. No question. And let's see. Yeah, I do that too, actually, Andrew. I've been I've been doing I I don't do it on purpose. And I wouldn't say it's not part of my permanent workflow right now. But I do try that time to time. I will shoot in 4K and deliver in 1080p. I try it time to time just to kind of get a feel for it. I, but it's not my permanent workflow. But it might be eventually, because that, that ability to crop is kind of nice. But I found that cropping in on 4K is still not as good as shooting in 1080 directly. So I'm I'm kind of I'm kind of on the fence. I'm transitioning to doing it that way. But I found, at least with the cameras I'm using and the way that I shoot, because I just shoot in program mode. Okay, I don't do anything crazy, but I found that cropping in 4K is not as good as shooting 1080 to begin with. But I'm I'm just I'm just starting to do that more now. And I'll get a I'll get a better feel for it the more I do it. I know that one well. 500 pounds as you say before you know it 4 to 8000. I know, right? Ugh. Bob says, don't buy the next camera you think you need, but spend the same money on travel somewhere you haven't been, but always wanted. I'm not big on travel, actually. <laughs> if, yeah, for people that have been on my channel a while, that's known me over the years, you know I don't travel. I have not been on an airplane since 19... I think it was 98 or 99. Might have been 1998 was the last time I was on an airplane. It was definitely before we had the terrorist attack on the Twin Towers here in 9-11.
That's the last time I was on a plane and went anywhere. Swear to God, that is it. I've not been out of the state of this area, right in my little DMV area, in a long time. I did drive to South Carolina uh, or North Carolina briefly for a few days to do a wedding. And uh, I've gone to Pennsylvania, which is just a couple hours north. But yeah, I have not been more than a day's travel from anywhere by car uh, in the last, how many years has it been now? Almost 25 years. Um, I don't even have a passport. So, yeah. So, expense on, to me, I don't know why. One day I'm going to travel again, hopefully before I die. I need to get a passport. But they're like 500 bucks. I mean, you're out 500 bucks. Well, I guess if you don't, if you don't rush it, you can get them for 50 bucks. But anyway. You get a, I get a passport. Where am I going to go? It's like thousands of dollars to travel anywhere. I could buy another camera. And I know this is the argument you're making, right? Instead of buying a camera, go travel. But I, I, I just don't have any desire. I did it once. I traveled everywhere in the 90s, all over the country, in the United States. And I've been to the east, right? Malaysia, Hong Kong. Uh, Singapore, whatever, you know, out there, right? Never been to the UK, but uh, I didn't like it at all. I hated it. And that, and this is the thing about me, right? Is like, <clears throat> there's very few second chances with me. If I do something and I don't like it, that's it. I don't do it again, right? Like I got married once. That was it. Never doing that again. And travel, did it once. Uh, like out of the country, I've done it once. Never did it again. Um, I did like driving to different places and traveling within the U.S. That I don't mind doing. And the pro But the problem I have now is uh, I have Ellie. She is not travel friendly. Number one. Number two, I can't get anybody to watch her. Okay? Uh, and I'm not going to put her in a kennel. I just, I just, because that, that's just so expensive. You know, I'm not exactly raining money here lately, right? It's been very, very lean at the Rob Trek house, let me tell you. I'm stealing creamer and little, little ketchup packets from the restaurants now. I'm trying to scrape by because I spent all my money on gear. <laughs> I didn't, I didn't even spend my money. It's all on credit card. <laughs> then my life is pathetic. It's, it's so pathetic. Let's hope to see a new S1R on the way. Fingers crossed and I'm all in. Yeah. I do want an S1R. They're going, there was one on Adorama for like $1,330. I should have got it. It's gone now. But that was a good deal for an S1R. I should have got it. I could have put that on my credit card like that. And I mean, one thing I've been very good at is managing my credit. My credit is perfect. I mean, I got like a 20 year perfect record, but. Uh, and because my credit is so good, I can transfer things around and get 0% forever. <clears throat> That's why it takes me forever to pay things off. Uh, Rob said, you need to expand your merchandise line and then you can afford the gas. I know, right? MFT is more than enough. Last year, I took a picture of a friend for his restaurant. This is now hanging six by six meters. Wow. Nobody ever asks if a full frame or shot or not. Yeah, it's, you hear that all the time, right? Clients never ask what kind of camera you have or what kind of image it was shot on. Apparently, there's one agency like Jimmy Chang talked about that does require a little higher megapixel. But uh, generally speaking, I'm not I'm not seeing it even in the professional world or hearing about it in a professional world as much needing more than 20 meg. My God, it's like after two o'clock. I've been on a while. Um, I need to I need to wrap this up. Yeah, the M1X is nice. It is nice. I agree. 
I, David Teller let me borrow his for a couple of weeks. It was really nice. I mean, I, I, now that I, I can get it for like in the $600 range, I'm like, I should just get it. You know? But I'm, then again, I'm like, what would I do with it? I have an OM1. I can get a grip for that. I got, I got, you see that shelf? I got too many cameras now. HO2 about this for Micro Four Third did a 12 mile country walk today with the M102 and a 12. For, oh, yeah, that's a great combination. I forgot that it was in my rucksack. It was so small and light. Oh, that's too bad. Well, next time, Anton. Yeah, Micro Four Thirds is awesome, though. How did I get all the way back up there in the chat? This chat window is really annoying. The way that I look at it on my screen. Okay, so I was there. I was there. Good idea. And this and this. Home One X needs to come out with a new sensor. Yeah. That would be nice, right? The OM One X. I mean, it'd be nice to get a new sensor. I mean, I think I think they still can do more with the sensor they have already, this 20 megapixel. Um, because it is, it's technically, it is a uh, 40, it's an 80, what is it? It's like, a, it's, there's four pixels per pixel on this, right? It's a quad pixel sensor. So theoretically, it is like an 80 megapixel sensor. Uh, but my thinking is that the R&D department at OM Systems, it's possible, I don't know, I'm speaking out my butt, but I feel like they haven't, they haven't reached the potential of what that sensor can do yet. But regardless of what they can do with that sensor, Having uh, having just a few more megapixels might be might mean something to a lot of people, right? You know, just having 24, 25, like the Panasonic sensor. What would be perfect is if they had the Olympus Pen F with that sensor from Panasonic, the 25 megapixel sensor. Put that in the Pen F Mark II, because the Pen F Mark II doesn't need to be a sports action camera, right? So we don't need to worry about rolling shutter and and uh, well, not the Panasonic has that problem. It doesn't. Imagine that though, right? We have the we have that Panasonic 25 megapixel sensor in the Pen F Mark II. They wouldn't, you know, they don't have to reinvent the wheel. Just take what's off the shelf. <clears throat> the OM One X, however, needs a new sensor on its own. Uh, something like a 25 to 30 megapixel, right? Like Klaus is saying, uh, so that it can do 6K video over sample down to 4K. Um, I think you need to be at about 30 megapixels to do that or 33 megapixels to be able to do that. But anyway, they can do it. I just, I think technically there's no challenge, right? They could, they know how to do it. It's just a matter of financially and business wise and everything else makes sense for them. Um, my own 5.3 bought a reefer from Olympus died app. Ooh. Too expensive to fix. Yeah, that's always the case. I'm thinking of getting used on one, but I'm discouraged that they won't continue to support it. I'm a little concerned myself. As is on firmware version 1.5, the camera is everything I want it to be. I wouldn't worry about it. Personally, I would have no problem replacing my OM1 with another OM1. Um, I'd probably just get a Mark II anyway, but if the Mark II wasn't out and I had to replace my OM1, I wouldn't have a problem buying another one today. But I get it. Long-term support is another buying decision, right? Are they going to support this camera in the future? Uh, that is that that's a very important thing to consider for a lot of people. It's not for me so much. You know, I I 
if this is if they if Olympus OM systems stop tomorrow, I'd be okay. I'd be still very content with the gear that I have. But for a lot of people, they that's not acceptable, right? It's unacceptable that this camera is either gone or not being supported, or they go out of business. That's unacceptable, uh, you know, option. So I get it. Uh, but um, time will tell. I, I don't know what to say. If that's, a, if that's a critical thing for you that it gets supported in the future, you may want to just get the Mark II if it's within your budget. If not, um, if you can get a really good deal, like $1,000 or less for an OM-1, then I think it's so relevant that it doesn't get supported in the future, right? Because you got such a good deal on it that you build into the price the fact that it's not going to get supported later, but that it's a great deal for what it is. It's like a lot of people buy these old mechanical Leicas for thousands of dollars. And there's nobody around to fix them anymore. I mean, there are, right? But they're far and few between. So, you know, you're basically buying a camera that's not supported anymore. I mean, that's a bad example. I take it back. Uh, mechanical cameras, you can usually find somebody to fix them somewhere that you can mail it off to and get fixed. Electronic, the old uh, electronic, and this is why mechanical film cameras are more popular is because they still can be fixed usually. But the electronics, it's hard to find the parts to fix cameras that use any kind of electronics. How about this for Micro Four Third Advantage? Oh, sorry, I did, I did do this one. Did my chat just jump up 10 steps again? You know, downgrading to an OM5 Mark II, that's not, that's not a downgrade in my opinion. The OM5 Mark II is an awesome camera in its own league. It doesn't, it, it should not be compared to any other camera. Um, that camera is just outstanding. And I took it out for a while because I just loved using it. And, you know, it's, I don't know, I should take it out more. I, I like my Pen F a little better, but I like that the M5 Mark II with the 25 millimeter Leica, man, that, that is an amazing combination. I gotta try it with the 300 F4 Pro. But there, there are just some cameras, in my opinion, that cannot be associated with being an upgrade or downgrade. They just kind of stand on their own, like the Pen F. EM5 Mark II. These two cameras, in my opinion, stand on their own and should not be compared to any other camera. The EM1 Mark II, EM1 Mark III, yeah, these are cameras, they're, they're working cameras, they can be upgraded. Okay, these, these are cameras that can be upgraded. When the new one comes out, you sell the old one. You know, who cares, right? <clears throat> OM1, same thing. The Mark II, if I could justify it, I would not miss the OM1 Mark I at all. I know Jimmy has some, Jimmy Chang has some nostalgia about the Olympus name being on. I don't care. You know, I don't care what it says on the, on the brand, it's, you know, whatever branding it is. But, uh, yeah, OM1 Mark I, I will not miss that camera when I upgrade it because I'll be upgrading, right? I'm not going to miss that camera. But if I ever sold my Pen F, or lost my Pen F and couldn't replace it, or my EM1, EM5 Mark II, I would definitely have regrets and miss it. Uh, just like the S1R, I am feeling like that is another camera that should stand on its own and not be an upgrade type camera. That camera is such a good camera in its own right. Uh, and should not be compared, you know, to other cameras that are better. Like like this A7R5. When the A7R6 comes out, am I going to miss this if I upgrade? I, I'm never upgrading this camera because I, I just don't, I don't have kind of the love and joy for this yet. Maybe I will in the future, but 
There's there's a lot of little things that bug me about this camera. Right, let me show you one thing that really bugs me. You know, like on the Olympus cameras, when you um, let me see if I can demonstrate this. There's just little things like this. Like I, I ran across this the other day. Let me push uh, super control panel. I'll show you guys in a second. All right. So let me go into super control panel. And I'm going to pick a different, different pro. So there's natural, right? Portrait, monochrome, art, color creator, yada, yada, yada. Right? All this good stuff. All right. I'm selecting a picture profile on the OM1, and it tells me in plain English what that picture profile is. On this, on this camera, let me put the lens cap on. Or anyway, I don't know if you can see this. Let me see if I can get this to focus. It's going to be too bright. You see, all right, yeah. If I put, if I put my hand over this. I need a lens cap. Hold on. <clears throat> I just had one here. Here. All right. All right. See that? All right. Focus. Now focus. It says BW, black and white. ST. PT, NT, what the hell are these? Why, why can't they spell it out? Why is it abbreviated like this? The only one I get is BW, black and white. But what is SE? Maybe sepia? What's ST? Why? And then I go into these. Everything is spelled out here. All the little sub settings. I have an awesome black and white setting, by the way, for this camera now. But seriously, you know, like, why? Why is that abbreviated? And and I don't get it. I don't get it. Little things like that just bother me. Um, you know, there's little things on the Olympus camera, OM system, that bother me, too. Don't get me wrong. But that... That just seems totally illogical to me when they have the room to write the letters in English all the way across. Ugh. Um... Just skimming through the comments real quick, because I, I should. Oh, yeah, the 12 to 50, I'm sorry, we were talking about this earlier, has weather sealing. I don't know if that's critical or not. Wow, okay. I have over 30,000. I have over 30 K-mount lenses. Wow. Wow. I assume you mean the Pentax, right? That's the K-mount. Yeah, I'm with you on that. 1.8 lenses to be weather sealed. That would be nice. That's interesting. Getting rid of your 12 to 40 if you have the 12 to 100. I don't think that makes sense. I mean, it depends on how you shoot, obviously. But I could... I could... I, I could... I would never buy the 12 to 100 for me. Because um, F4 ain't going to cut it for what I would use it for, which would be indoor events. Having every stop of light possible is a big deal. Um, even though a lot of times I use flash when I'm indoors, 
being able to bring in the ambient light and mix that with flash is easier when you have a 2.8 than an f4. I mean, there's a lot of reasons, but for me, it wouldn't make sense, but it might make perfect sense for you. Um, what's this negative waves of Moriarty? I'm 76 in March and we'll walk over. I know, right? I don't know. I don't know where this 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 feeling is coming from. Maybe it'll pass. But these last this past year or so, I haven't been feeling like a, a long time lifer, you know, centurion type person. I've been feeling more like a sixties, seventies kind of guy. If I make it to seventy, maybe it'll pass. Maybe in a few years I'll feel like oh, 75, 80, no problem. But right now I'm not feeling it. Because this, this decline, and it's, it's my fault, right? I, I went on this diet <clears throat> to lose this weight. So if you look at images of me from before, I go to a stream one year ago today, and you'll see a big difference in, in just my face. But never mind my waistline and my overall weight. But um, So I went through a lot of work to do that, and I'm still not feeling... Because I was feeling really bad last year, physically. And this year, I'm still not, fe I'm feeling better, but not, you know, my energy levels went up, but I'm not at the level I was, say, five years ago. Five years ago, when I was in my early 50s, I was feeling 100%, like I could live to 100. But right now, with my memory going and my health, not, not, you know, my, I wouldn't say health, but my physical fitness level. So I need I need to do something weight training or going to the gym. I can't go to the gym. I can't afford the gym. But doing doing more exercise. Like I went out for a couple hours this morning photo walk. I need to do that more every day, not just on the weekends and stuff. Anyway. Uh the key to traveling is not to try and do so much in a short period of time like doing Europe in a week. Choose a region and spend a week. That's true. Oh, Jeanette, how you doing? <laughs> Man, I know, right? That's what I was trying to tell my cousin. He traveled like the entire country in a few months. I'm like, golly. Anyway, uh, and you know how big the United States is? This huge, giant, just ginormous country, relatively speaking, to like the UK, right? Like in the UK, you can be in a different country in a couple hours, in any direction almost. In the U.S., a couple hours barely gets you out of your own city, <laughs> you know? Uh, you know how it is in, in traffic, right? But then it's like, you know, just to get through one state is hundreds of miles. Uh, like, if I want to go to Florida, it's a thousand miles to go from here, from where I am now to Florida. And I'm like halfway there from where New York is. Because it's five hours up to New York, ten hours down to Florida. And if I want to get, and that's just across the state line, then to go from the one part of Florida down to the other end is another six to eight hours. It's just, oh. anyway, um, but yeah, I, got, I get your point. Like, it'd be nice if I could just go somewhere for a month and just take my time and really get to know the place more than just one week, right? and hitting all the normal tourist areas. It just, I need to be at a point in my life where I can afford to do that. Probably be never, but there's so many places here in the US I haven't been to that I want to go to. If you're worried about a camera being supported, OMS is probably the last company to consider right now. Maybe. I can get firmware updates are nice, but it's like, yeah, that's true. I agree with that statement. The camera wasn't good enough when you bought it. So true. I mean, I expect fixes, right? If there's a bug in the system, they need to fix it. And they did do that by firmware 1.3. I think all the bugs that I was having, because I had the camera lock up on me a couple of times and I had to take the battery out. But since firmware 1.3, I haven't had any problems with this camera. I think one time I had something happen which is to be expected, but in all the, the, the two years I've had, or ever since I updated to 1.3, I'm now in firmware 1.5. Camera's been flawless. It 
have been owned the M10 Mark II and the M1 Mark II. Those cameras either had everything in the kitchen sink or got firmware updates that made them new cams. People therefore expect. Yeah, the Mark II series, man. They they were the best. And, you know, there's like firmware updates out to Yazoo for at least the M1 Mark II. Brain fog detox, I know. Dave will tell you. David Crooks, that is, will tell you, man, when we're out on photo walks, the person will be standing right in front of me, and I can't remember their name. It's like playing hangman. You know, it's like, give me the first letter. Like, this morning, it happened to two different people. Like, it was Steve. Steve was like, okay, I'll give you a hint. It starts with an S. And I'm like, Sean, Sean. He's like, no. Because I called him Kevin. And he's like, no, I'm not Kevin. I'm like, oh. So he gave me a letter, and I he gave, and then he gave me the second letter T, and I was like, okay, Steve, golly, you know. Channel train. What is that? I know I have Dane Bramage. Maybe I have Dane Bramage, right? Like, I don't know. Okay, so um. UK is 26 miles to France. No kidding. I know. It's like amazing. The landscapes and the different districts you guys have out there for beautiful photography. Um, that's why there's so many like landscape photographers on YouTube that are in the UK, right? Thomas Heaton, Jane Popsis, uh, several others, right? There's, there's some hardcore uh, landscapes i mean and they all take different pictures somehow like you can look at the photography of all of them and they're all very different to some extent sometimes simon baxter and this other dude are very similar uh you know the woodland type photography i guess no matter where you are in the world that's going to look pretty similar but uh, a lot of landscape photographers and things you know that the scenery and stuff looks very different Um, yeah, I was thinking about that today. My love, I, you know, I drove the Jeep today, so the name tag I have is in the, in the Mazda. But yeah, nobody's going to wear name tags. I, I think it makes sense at like indoor events where we're doing something. Like if I, if I'm going to teach a class, the name tags would be awesome because then I could point to people. Or if they ask me a question, I can I don't have to point at them. I could say I could just say yes, Janine, or yes, whatever. You know, how can I? You know, I, mean, I can I can look at people and talk to them by their name. But anyway, all you need is love, Rob, huh? When's the last time I went to get a checkup? Maybe help remove some doubt and anxiety. Uh, I think it's been twenty years since I've been to a doctor for anything. Well, no, I know exactly. It was when I was age 40 was the last time I was at a doctor. I went when I was 40. So it's been 17, 18 years since I've been to a doctor. I had a phone consultation with a doctor about something else. Like I got a tick. I woke up and there's a tick on me. So I, I pulled it off and he gave me some antibiotics or something for tick bites. But I, you know, it's it's not it's not a physical health thing. I feel like my health is okay. It's just it's something else. Something else is like, and 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 understand this. I'm very heavily influenced by the kind of genre of TV that I'm watching. So, um. I've been watching that show. I love this show, Lucifer, on Netflix. I love that show. It's a detective show. It's not about good and evil so much, right? Like, it's not like a supernatural kind of show. It's more of a detective uh, comedy sitcom type show. But I'm watching a lot of that. Maybe that's what's doing it, right? Because I'm watching a lot of this sort of supernatural afterlife type stuff. Anyway. 
Yeah, it's been a long time, though. Makes my landscapes of the UK a rarity on YouTube. What do you mean? I'm, I'm a little bit lost what you mean by that. Oh, this is the prefix. Not many YouTube photographers around me in the UK. Got it. Got it. So it makes my landscapes of the UK a rarity. Okay, got it. Um, all right, so I'm going to go. I, I've been on here for coming on three hours, but it's been awesome. You guys, you guys are great. I appreciate you putting up with me for that long because many of you have been here for the whole time. But we need to take a break eat maybe some lunch and go take some pictures because it's going to be sunset here very soon. And uh, I'm, I don't know, I got a bug to go out and take some more pictures, maybe just of in backyard with Ellie, but uh, whatever you do, don't waste the time that you have here on this earth uh, with, with gear, right? Go out and take a break and do the, do the reason we have all these things in our lives and enjoy them, okay? So thanks so much for being here. Uh, I will see you guys again next week. Have a good weekend.